love you. Amen. 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 Um, so, it's slightly different this week. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to do uh, offering and thingies at the end. Uh, as we don't have an announcement, <coughs> we're just going to go straight in to the uh, preaching. Please, luckily, it's me this morning. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas to you too. Okay, so last Sunday in December, in of 2019, have we got any stories or testimonies of what God has done in 2019? Anyone from the congregation, give me something that God has done in your life in 2019. Uh, what I want to do is build up a bit of, a bit of faith, a bit of atmosphere, a bit of uh, praise to Jesus of what he's done. So come on out, anyone shout out if God's done anything in your life in 2019. You Paul, Vicky or Lily. I had uh, two spurs with a bone in my spine. Um, spurs are bones that go uh, and pierce, uh, you know, where they go. And mine were grown in the spine, uh, which was touching my the middle of the canal. Um, used to give me great pain, absolutely horrendous pain. Um, I got used to it, I. I haven't got the spurs anymore, I don't think, because they're not giving me any problems. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just amazing. I look forward to next Christmas. Seeing what God's done. Do you want to say something? I know I'm happy Sunday. I have gratitude every day of my life. But the last couple of months, that has changed my life. Gave me deep time to strength, and the family around me will always love me. Amen. Wow. Amen. 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 Um, so Simon and I have, well, I'm at uni, so I'm a student uh, working part time for church, so we don't have much money, and I just it's been something that I've really had to surrender to God and just be like, God, okay, you're in charge of our finances. And there are times when it's really hard, but I've just seen how God is so good in coming through with that, and that there's various different ways. I try and put God in a box, and someone will give us money, and I'm like, oh, okay. So now I know where it's going to come from next time, and then I have faith for it next time. But then he blindsides me, and it comes from a completely different direction, mm -hmm. and one that I thought I'd figured out. And I'm like, every time I think I've figured God out, he does something else, and he does something even more amazing to just keep me trusting in him and it's not yeah I, 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 I don't know I'm already talking on the spot but yeah I've just seen him come through for us as a couple um even in our house I don't know how many sorry I don't know how many of you knew about our house when we got married in August but we had an amazing flat lined up from some friends and their son was meant to be moving to Italy and didn't end up moving so we our plans to move into this house completely fell through we had nowhere to move into and all of a sudden the house came available for us. But it was like the perfect time to move in. So yeah, I could go on. Like Lizzie said, I could just keep going on. So, I'm off. so even in that moment we have, you know, uh, peace and love, we have healing, we have provision, you know. I just want to stir up a bit of faith in this church this morning. You know, we're at the end of a decade. So we're at 2019. So I was trying to think, I sit there yesterday thinking Okay. Last 10 years, how has God changed my life in the last 10 years? So I thought, okay, to start of this uh, decade, I was 16 years old. Uh, I was still in school. I know somebody's surprised. I was about 18. Uh, <laughs> I was 16 years old. Um, you know, I'm in school, um, basically just trying to people please, trying to get as many friends to like me as possible. Don't really have any relationship, personal relationship with Jesus. Um, barely even, you know, I. I go to church, but I don't really know God. You know, I'm just I'm not really the type of person that I wanted to be. And that's the start of 10 years ago. So 10 years, and now, you know, obviously I'm working here at the church, <coughs> lovely wife, we've got a house, you know, God's provision is all the way through my life. You know, I've got a law degree, I'm in the middle of doing another degree. You know, God's hand is just constantly on me all the way through. You know, I, I've been, obviously I had a knee operation, we healed, um, 
I don't even remember I had it. I can't even put any blame on it ever. People always ask me how I did. I could barely even have the operation. You know, things like that. That's just in 10 years. That's just me thinking back, literally, briefly, two minutes, what has God done to me? You know, I really felt God wanted me to speak this morning about testimony. The power of speaking out the testimony of God. So today I want us to have a look about, in the Bible, what that they say about testimonies. So, you know, the brief layout of the preach is, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about testimonies, what they are, what they do. Uh, and have a look about how um, the disciples testified about Jesus and witnessed for Jesus. Then we're going to look about how that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit and how that power brings freedom. Okay, so that's a little brief overview. Does that sound all right? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Okay, so first question, what is a testimony? What do people think it is? A shout out if you have any answers. Silence for the first time in this church. <laughs> Describing something that's happened. What's that, sorry? Describing something that's happened. Describing something that's happened, yes. So we often think, sometimes when I say testimony, people think, you know, in baptisms, we have testimony. That's the only time we have testimony. When people tell you about their life, I grew up in a church family, or I didn't grow up in a church family. That sort of thing as a testimony. Well, that's what I think it is. That's what I thought it was. You know, and how God's changed our life before baptisms and after baptisms. But testimonies are simply just proclaiming what God has done. <coughs> simply, just, when I testify, if I have a testimony, it's just what has God done for me. So each one of these is a testimony of God. So all of us have continuous testimonies. So we need to keep talking about the testimony <coughs> of God. So testimony comes from the Hebrew root word, which means to do again. So essentially, when we are telling people what God has done, we're proclaiming that he wants to do it again. So when we're speaking out all these things that God has done, we're inviting God to move and do the same thing again. So essentially, the testimony is doing faith for it to happen again. So we don't always just say them for the sake of it. You know, when we all hear what God has done, it builds our faith. Even in those two minutes, I'm thinking, wow, God did all those things. And we're sort of, you know, we're built up. We go, wow, look how powerful our God is. So it says every time a testimony is spoken, it comes with God's covenant to repeat the miracle. So we repeat a testimony to create an atmosphere for the miracles to be duplicated. So, you know, if we said, oh, Libby's been completely healed, you know, God is a healer, look how he's healed Libby, that builds the faith in this room for God to do it again. Yeah. For God doesn't change. Yeah. So if he does it for Libby, he's going to do it for any of us. So God doesn't go, actually I really want to be a healer for this person, but I'm not a healer for somebody else. <coughs> actually when we speak out what God's doing, we're saying to God, do it again. Do it again. So that's why I feel like God was just saying to us this morning, is to build faith in this room for God to do something again this morning. So Bill Johnson says, well, He's talking about what does a testimony do? He says, the declared testimony creates access to the very anointing that brought about the testimony in the first place. When we declare the testimony of the Lord, God releases his authority to enforce the word and duplicate the miracle. He goes on and says, in every story of what God has done, there is an unveiling of his nature and an invitation to know him experientially in the same way. So when we speak of what God's doing, of his nature, it reveals the character of God to other people. So when Millie's saying, oh, God came and he provided for us to live, we are to, it reveals the character that God is loving and he's faithful and he's good. Or when we say that God has healed Libby, it reveals to us what God is like. So when it, as he says, so Bill Johnson, he says, it releases his authority to enforce the word and duplicate this miracle. And that's really what I felt God strongly put on my heart this morning, that he wants to do something special in this morning and through us as a church going forward. So we're at the end of a decade, we're going forward to 2020. I feel like God is telling us that testimonies are going to be powerful. That, you know, we all have a testimony. <coughs> all of us in this room have a testimony of something God has done. And actually we need to speak that out. Actually, we need to tell people, look what God has done. Sometimes, you know, we need to focus on these and ponder on what God has done. As Maureen said, something about a difficult Christmas. And we need reminding of God's character. Because the enemy will lie to us about what the character of God is like. We go, we have, God moves for us, and the next time we're waiting for money, 
and we, we forget about what God's done before. We're going to be worried. We're going to be fearful. So if I speak out the testimony of what God did before, well, in this situation, I don't have that fear because I know he's provided before. So, for example, I'm going, God, you know we need the money, but I've seen you do it again, so I know your character is good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is everyone with me? Yeah. Okay, so testimony creates faith and brings anointing to move again powerfully. So I, at the end, you know, we're going to have a moment where we're going to see what God wants to do and see God move powerfully again, as he has for all of us this year. So I'm going to leave the space at the end for God to move because he wants to. Okay, so that's just a little brief bit about what testimony is. So let's have a look in the Bible. It's a decent place to start. Phil Johnson says, a witness is someone with a testimony. It is the very word Jesus used to describe his true disciples. So when we give testimonies, we are witnessing of Jesus. So Acts 1, verse 8, if anyone's got their Bibles, uh, we're going to have two passages in Acts, so you may not open up to Acts. Um, for those that know that's sort of the fifth book in the New Testament, if you've got your Bibles. This is actually a secret test to see who brings their Bibles to church. So I'm watching everyone who opens one. <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. I will be reporting back to Sam. <laughs> so Acts 1, verse 8. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this is Jesus speaking to his disciples just before he ascends back into heaven. So what Jesus says is, you will receive power <coughs> when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So witnesses. So Jesus clearly asks us, be a witness. So what does a witness mean? You know, we are clearly, Jesus says, we are to witness telling people about me everywhere. <coughs> so Jesus gives this command to his disciples just before he goes back to heaven. So then we see the ascension of Jesus in Acts 1. And, we, and then we continue to see during the book of Acts what the disciples do when Jesus goes. So I propose that they do two things. They proclaim the good news about Jesus that he is resurrected from the dead, and he is the Messiah. And then two, they demonstrate this truth through power, and through healings and through miracles. So let's read Acts 3, verse 1 to 10. Peter heals a crippled beggar. Uh, I'm in the NLT, you can read it. Okay. Uh, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, <coughs> expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and <coughs> helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar, they had seen so often the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all <coughs> rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Sometimes when we read this, the Bible, we get used to stories like this. We think, oh, it was just in the Bible, that's just normal, you know, there were healings. But this isn't even Jesus. Jesus isn't even here. Jesus is in heaven at this moment. These are Peter and John, two disciples, two ordinary people, who have just received the Holy Spirit and then have gone out and done it. So as we see, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So Peter instantly says where, he got, where he's getting this power from. He said, in the name of Jesus. He isn't pr professing, professing to have it himself. He isn't saying, look how great I am, get up. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. 
And then, obviously, it does happen. And then what's the reaction? Everyone was absolutely astounded. And if we carry on, I'm not going to, but in verses 11 to 26 of this chapter, you then see Peter, who is able to say to thousands of people, look what you have done. You have killed the Messiah, the Son of God. But for me, I don't know if you would agree, but that statement is a lot more powerful when you've got a completely healed beggar there dancing around saying Jesus has healed him. If I said to you guys, you've killed the Son of God, but there isn't that, there isn't that proof, I don't, think, I don't think Peter's would be as effective. It gives him the opportunity to say, look, God is, Jesus is the Messiah, and you can explain people the character of God to people when there is evidence of that character. Look, Jesus is a healer. Look, he's done it. He's obviously not just a normal human being. We know he's not, because he's supposed to have died, yet here I am healing someone when Jesus is supposedly dead. Of course, look, he killed him. Without the power, sometimes our faith doesn't look real. I don't know if you, you have these, you know, sometimes we talk about God, we talk about how great God is, God's love is to people, they maybe not know him, but if this isn't demonstrated, or if people don't see that in action, then sometimes the power, sometimes the, the power of your words, of what you say about God, sometimes that just falls flat. You know, if I declare God is a healer, but then when it comes to it, I'm too nervous or too worried about what people think to actually pray for it, and then they're not real. You know, sometimes God can't be glorified in that moment because I, myself has got in the way of God confirming who he is. Does that make sense? So if I say God is a healer, something, God wants to display the fact that he is to other people. Because that is how he reveals his character, as he said in this thing. His character is revealed through God moving. So what else does the Bible say about proclaiming the gospel? So for us in here, we may be thinking, you know, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to tell people about Jesus. I don't know how to show Jesus to others. This is what Paul says in the book of Romans. It's Romans 15, verse 17 to 19, if people are following along. It says, Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Ju Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. So notice here that Paul says the full proclamation of the gospel. So when we talk about proclaiming the good news or speaking about Jesus, the full proclamation of the gospel, he says, is leading people by what he has said and done. So when we look, so what we say, when we say say, is preaching the gospel, the good news, who Jesus is, and then the do is displaying this truth to others. So it's not just say, God is great, God is love, it's do. We have to do something about it to show that God is what he says he is. That is why testimony is so important. Sometimes, it's, it's so much more powerful when people come to the baptisms and they see what God has done. It's so powerful because you cannot deny what God has done in someone's life. It's just sitting here, I'm seeing people, everyone, I know how much God has changed their life in this room. And that displays more to someone sometimes than just the word about who God is. So I, to, you know, even if we're here, we, Rita, God has filled me with peace. Yeah, because God, it says Jesus is the Prince of Peace. It gives so much more power to the words that I say about God when it's demonstrated. You know, yeah, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Look, he's given me to peace. That she just can't explain that she has. We need to have both for a full proclamation. I, I struggle with speaking to people about Jesus. You know, I, I don't think I ever really bring up Jesus. I don't really actively go, Jesus this, Jesus that. And, you know, some people have a gift of it. We look at Charmaine. Charmaine brings people through the doors every ten minutes, I think, this church. She, you know, pe people have a gift of it, but we ha all have to be doing it. But it's a challenge for myself, I think. I think God's challenging me as much as everyone else today. That's why I'm preaching on it. About testimony, about speaking about what, it's got, what God has done. 
So Randy Clark says, the primary purpose of the healings and miracles is the demonstration of the gospel and the goodness of God. So the primary purpose of these miracles is to demonstrate how good God is. So we can't just go chasing these eyes in these miracles, like looking for these healings everywhere, looking for God to do something. Because actually all that does is point us to God anyway. So we need to be chasing God. Our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus. And then these healings and miracles will come. As we declare who God is, he shows it. So we've been singing about who God is today. And then he's going to want to show it to them. Because that's just what that's what he's like. The testimonies of what we've said is bringing anointing and faith into this room for God to move powerfully. Hopefully powerfully through me, but hopefully powerfully at the end. So we cannot idolise these miracles, but the whole point of them is to, is to show us who God is. Is everyone still with me? Are we doing alright? Yeah. Some people fall asleep. So Paul continues this in the book uh, of Corinthians. Uh, it's a book to the, the city of Corinth, so he writes a letter to people who were living in Corinth at the time, which is sort of like the modern day uh, Las Vegas. And he says, uh, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ. Sorry, Laurie, this is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2 to 5. If you, I know you know the Bible off the heart. I'll start again. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And I read that and I just thought that is amazing. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I speak about Jesus to someone or I've had a conversation about God, I then go away and I go, oh God, did I say the right words? I should have said this and not that. I should have, you know, maybe I should have said it slightly different or, you know, and it steals the joy of what God's doing when we're worried about how what we've said and whether it's been right. And that's what Paul's saying. It's not about the words. It's about God's power. So we have to trust that God moves through this person, through our words. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what we say. Don't get me wrong. Don't go around saying anything and just hope that God uh, will move through them anyway. But sometimes we put too much pressure on our words and what we say. You cannot argue people into the kingdom of God. It's not an argument. You know, sometimes we try and think that one sentence is going to really clinch it and they're going to come to Jesus. It's not about that. It's about actually the expression of God and showing God to people is so much more powerful than the words that we say. When they come together, what we say about God and then we demonstrate it, that's when the powerful combination comes together. What you say and then what you do. So what we do when you know we love people, you know, you show God's love, His goodness, His grace, His mercy to other people. But you know, maybe even through healings and miracles, it's God's power that brings the power to our words. And I don't know if we understand this. You know, it's, sometimes we get so hung up on oh, there's just that one thing they don't get. As soon as someone experiences God's love, that's it, and we never know where it comes from. You know, I take, I take kids to Soul Survivor every year. And every year you go, God, I don't have a clue how you're going to move. And we don't say anything to these kids. Not that we ignore them for the whole week. <laughs> That's a great tactic. Um, but we never, we don't say anything special. We don't do these special preachers. There's nothing that happens at Soul Survivor that is incredibly special in terms of the words. It's not wise and persuasive words that Mike Pillow actually uses. It's the fact that he leaves space at the end of the meeting for God's power. So he leaves space for the Holy Spirit, which we'll obviously just come on to a bit in a, in a minute. He leaves space for the Holy Spirit to move powerfully. So at the end of this service, I'm going to leave space for the Holy Spirit to move powerfully to honour the fact that it's not my words. It's not about how good my preaching is or what I say now. That doesn't matter. It's about Holy Spirit power moving through what I'm saying to express his character to all of you. So when I say it at the end, you know, when I open up to the Holy Spirit, we're saying, God, I've seen you move again, do it again now. So I'm preparing you all for the end when you're going to see God move powerfully. 
So Paul said, he carries on in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, and he says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Yeah, I just really feel that's for some people in this room, is just to reinforce it's not about talking people into the kingdom. It's not about persuading people to become a Christian. Just express God to them. Demonstrate God's love. Demonstrate his power. We all feel so much pressure. My brothers don't go to church. You know, my cousin, no, my cousins go to church. All these things, we feel the pressure to bring them to Jesus. As if God doesn't want them to come in. As if God doesn't, isn't desperately pursuing them and chasing after them to become a Christian. We think that my word is more powerful than God moving in, in their lives. So I think sometimes we need to stop idolizing ourselves and rely on God. Let's rely on God's power and see Him do the things that we want Him to do. That's what they're saying. It's what we say and then what we do. Jesus wants to do these things. Jesus wants people in the kingdom. Jesus wants to heal people. God is desperate to provide for you. God is desperate to show his goodness and his mercy to you. And we need to just rely on God's power and not on our own. So Jesus leads the disciples. And we, we, we follow in Acts. And what is the result? Mark 16 verse 20 says, And the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Uh, I mean, uh, it sounds pretty simple when we read it in the Bible. <laughs> God was with them. They went out and they, and they proclaimed Jesus' name. And God moved powerfully through them. God <coughs> did the miracles. God moved through them. So when they preach the goodness of God, when we say, look how amazing God is, God backs it up with the things that he does. And he's shown us over and over again. You know, I could spend hours sitting here just saying, Moses, how has God provided for you? Maria, how has God changed your life this year? And we can just go around. And we just see God con constantly confirming who he is to us. When we ask him to show himself, he does. Because he's desperate for you to know. He's desperate for you to understand his love. He's desperate for you to feel his peace and his joy. He's desperate for you to not be fearful of what's coming, because you know he's going to provide for you again. And that builds faith. You can talk things into being. You can pray things into being. You know. We, I was speaking to Libby. I wasn't planning to say this story, but I think it's important. <laughs> um, we were just, I, I, you know, I was talking to Libby. I love Libby. She's my you know, spiritual mother. She looks after me. Um, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> but it, that is important, by the way, with all these spiritual mothers and fathers, can I say? You need to get under someone. You need to look at someone and say, I love what you're about, I'm going to learn from you. Yeah. So I love Libby's uh, constant prayer, constant thankfulness for God. Libby's had diseases, afflicted the whole of her life, but she's still going, how amazing is God? How amazing is God? But where should we go to Jesus? You, you know. So I want to hang out with Libby because I love what she's about. And I prayed, Libby, can you help? You know, we need this money, we need finances. And we were walking around um, Kumbar, knocking on doors, and Libby said, oh, I just really feel that God... Um, he's going to give you X amount in your bank account. And I said, Libby, that's it. How did you know? She was like, what? I said, literally two days ago, someone rang me up and said they're going to put that exact money in my bank account wow. that day. And Libby, I asked Libby to talk for more. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Libby, don't let it go again. And I said, Libby, she's like, ask Libby to pay for double that amount and go again. God is desperate to provide for me. Of course he wants to provide for us. He's called us here. He's not going to leave us on our own. So now, when it comes to it again, when, we get, when we're struggling again, I go, me and Lily will go, God, remember what you did last time. God, I know you're a provider, so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for you to provide. I won't be fearful about him providing because I know he's done it before. And as we said, God doesn't change. So the testimonies of God can be used to repeat the miracle over and over again. So I just want us to quickly have a look about uh, where the power comes from. So we you know we talk about miracles, all that thing. So Bill Johnson says, to fully preach the good news of the gospel, power is required. For without power, it is no longer good news. So if, so if I tell someone how amazing God's love is, but then it isn't demonstrated, you know, my testimony can lose its power on that person. Because Sometimes you can see people who, maybe they haven't experienced God's love, or 
Or we're Christians, but we don't see God move often. We don't see his miracles, we don't see his healing. And sometimes I go into a church and I think, <coughs> this doesn't even sound like good news. I think if I wasn't a Christian I came into some churches, I wouldn't even know it was good news or there's a reason to be joyful. Because sometimes without the power, <coughs> the demonstration of God's love and his power, you know, sometimes that loses its joy of the good news. We've got to believe that it is actually good news. It's good. There's a reason to be joyful because God actually comes through for people. He actually does what he says. And every time I'm surprised that he does what he says, but it just reinforces and it builds my faith to continue next time to go again. So in Acts 1, 8, the first uh, passage I read, Jesus told his disciples they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So the term power here is the word dynamis, which some of you might know where the word dynamite comes from. <coughs> this is used seven times in Acts uh, to refer to power, to work miracles in connection with gospel proclamation. So the power is to work through the Spirit. So you work wonders through the Spirit. But the power comes when we testify who God is. So God doesn't always support the person, he supports the, the things that you're saying, the things that you're doing. So you know, when we pray for people, if we say, you know, in Jesus' name, Jesus, you are healer, heal this person. We've just spoken out who God is, and then we're saying, do it. You know, and it's through the Holy Spirit power. And so who is this power for? As a church, I think we need to know that we all have power. The Holy, there's no baby Holy Spirit. So when you receive, when you ask God into your life, if you invite the Holy Spirit into your life, you have the full Holy Spirit. So all these things that we see the people doing in Acts is available for all of us. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. Everyone, anyone who believes in me, anyone, he doesn't add, he doesn't add any clauses to that. He doesn't say, as Noreen was talking about earlier, you don't have to be holy enough. You don't have to have prayed a thousand prayers to receive this power. You just have to believe in Jesus, that he will do, and understand that he will do what he says he will do. All you have to do is believe. You know, I really feel like God's, this is what God's saying for us in 2020, is believe. Let's have faith for something amazing to happen in this church. Let's not be content with this amount of people, or, you know, <coughs> the occasional things that God is doing. Let's just have faith for more, and invite the Holy Spirit's power. Invite him into your life. Say, God, I, I really want to do, I really want to show you to others. I really want to proclaim your goodness to others. Help me. All the, all the disciples did was they waited in that upper room for the Holy Spirit, and then they went out and preached everywhere. It doesn't, it's not about words, it's not about what you say, you know, up here, doesn't, if we pray, it doesn't matter about the words, you know, it's not, if God doesn't heal someone, it's not because you said the wrong words, let's put it out there, it's not all about formula, God is not a formula, if God heals, look how Jesus heals in the Bible, at one point he just says, get up and walk, sometimes he touches them, sometimes he spits and rubs their eyes, sometimes he rubs mud in people's eyes, I think Jesus just wants us to know it's not a formula. It's not about saying, you know, sometimes, what they say about the Pharisees is not about repeating over and over again what you want to say. You know, God, you're amazing. God, you're It's not about repeating just to look holy. It's just about the Holy Spirit coming in power. So finally, I think you'd be glad to know, I want my final point. The Holy Spirit that comes when we invite him into our life, when you've accepted Jesus as your saviour, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with you. And the Holy Spirit brings freedom. Freedom. We, in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Sometimes we sing that along and we love it. You know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I'm not going to sing because otherwise it would be but God is a God that brings freedom. God wants to bring freedom because that is who he is. Jesus says in Luke 4, 18 to 19, He has sent me, talking about God, He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, 
and that the time of the Lord's favour has come. So Jesus came to set the captives free, to set the oppressed free. So when he's asking us to do more than he did, he's asking us to do those things. We have the power to call those things into being through the Spirit. So, you know, it could be captive to addictions. It could be slaves to pornography. It could be you're oppressed by an illness or a disease, which, sounded by the amount of coughs I've heard in this room this morning, <laughs> is coming through this church. Jesus came to release all those things. So the Holy Spirit brings freedom. So when we ask for more of the Holy Spirit, yeah, we have that freedom to show it to others. That illness that you've got, oh, I know God doesn't want you to have that because he wants you to be free. <coughs> then you can speak it out over someone. I want us to have faith for, to be for freedom. If we're walking in bondage, that's not God. God doesn't want you to be ill. God isn't testing you by giving you this horrible thing. God doesn't give you anything bad. Because that is not who he is. You know, I sometimes hear people say, yeah, God's, God's testing me by not doing this. I, I don't, personally, I don't think that's true. Somebody might come and argue with me at the end. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that's true. Because that's not who God is. God wouldn't do that. God doesn't bring pain. He doesn't bring suffering. He doesn't bring that. God can sometimes use it and teach you in moments. But ultimately, he wants you to be free. He came, Jesus came on earth to bring that freedom. That was his sole thing. Freedom from sin ultimately on that cross. When he died, he set us all free completely. The, 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 who the Son sets free is free indeed. So it's completely free forever. Jesus sets us free. I'm going to finish with this. Bill Johnson, he says, I've quoted Bill Johnson about 20 times today. <laughs> And I loved it. And Randy, thank you. Without a constant awareness of God and the testimonies that speak of his nature, we will inevitably reduce our vision and ministry down to what we can accomplish with our gifts and strengths. So without a constant awareness of God and the testimonies that speak of his nature, we will reduce our vision and ministry down to what we can accomplish with our gifts and strengths. So the whole point of this, I want us to get, is the testimonies bring power. The Holy Spirit, speaking out what God has done, brings power for him to do it again. I don't know about you, but that excites me. <laughs> I think we need a bit of excitement today. It's the end of the year, we're all very tired, I can tell. But that excites me, that God wants to do all those things. And I feel like God is calling us as a church to do those things. No longer are we going to say... You know, over there, when revival comes, we'll see the news. But God will set people free when this point over in the future comes. No, it's now. Noreen just said, God doesn't say wait. God says now. Yeah. Now. That, you know, we move into 2020. Let's see God move. In, in faith, we'll, we'll proclaim what God is doing, and then we'll see him move. I feel like a new season is coming in Covenant Valley. I feel like God is wanting to move now. And God wants to do something amazing. And I want to stir up your faith. I want us to speak about what God is doing. The smallest of things will bring faith. will build up our faith and do something amazing. We need to keep talking those out to each other. We need to keep talking those out to people that don't know God. Know what God has done for me. My, my brothers, they are so surprised when... They're not even surprised anymore. I say something, and you know, we were struggling for this, but God has brought us money. Or, oh, I know someone who can do that for me. And they just go... Of course you do. That's just how you do that. <laughs> they, they've got more faith than us. They expect it to happen. They're just, they're just like, oh, well, of course. You know, if my brother even said, oh, maybe I should become a Christian. Oh, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm saying, look, God provides, and then he does. And then they go, wow, this Christianity is real. God is real. Yes, he is. So when you say, you know, we have people say, God heals people. God loves you so much that he wants to heal you. Boom, he heals you. You can't then go away going, oh no, God doesn't love me. God doesn't want to heal me. Because we've seen it. So, I, was, I just want us to receive the Holy Spirit. I want us to receive that power. If, if you're sat here this morning, you go, I want some of that power. I want to be able to do some of the things that, you know, that we, we see in the Bible. I want to have that boldness, that faith to talk about Jesus and to show it. I want us just to stand up. And I'm going to pray 
that we are filled. I'm going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have no idea what God wants to do. Pat's probably going to come up to me afterwards and say, this is the longest preach of your life, which you always go. Uh, it was really long, <laughs> but it was quite good. Um, oh, I don't know if that's about that kind of but the whole I'll see them. Okay, so, if that is you, I'd like you just to stand up. If you're saying, God, I want more. God, I want to see your power move, the Holy Spirit, through this kind of valley. I want to be 